Well, welcome to the Aging Boomers. I'm your host, Frank Sampson, and on this show, we discuss so many of the issues facing boomers and their parents in what we know is uh, definitely a, an aging population. And uh, thank you for all your support. Uh, I know many of you have gone on iTunes and subscribed and uh, downloaded uh, the Aging Boomers app on your iPhone or Android phone. So thanks so much for uh, following our podcast. Uh, we've gotten a lot of great comments and we've got a, a, another wonderful guest today. Uh, her name is uh, Sarah Zeff. Is it Geber? Is that the right pronunciation? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, Sarah's a, a certified retirement coach and workshop leader um, and recognized expert in the field of planning for the next phase of life with a focus on the 55 plus age group. That's our age group. Uh, Sarah has been among the first professionals in the field to recognize that the baby boom generation would reinvent the whole notion of retirement in a very exciting way. Sarah has a PhD in counseling and organizational behavior and a master's uh, in guidance and counseling and a BA in psychology. Uh, she's a native of San Francisco, of the San Francisco Bay Area. Sarah is an active member in the Financial Planning Association of Silicon Valley, the Life Planning Network, and Women in Consulting. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us on the Aging Boomers. Boomers. <laughs> I gotta, thanks, Frank. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, it's it's great to have you. You've done a lot of fine work and. You know, what, what's interesting, I understand you specialize in those that are aging alone or couples aging without children. Um, you've kind of given the term solo aging, which is interesting. And uh, what type of numbers are we talking about in that category? Well, I define solo aging as people, whether they're married or single, who do not have children. And... Uh, the numbers actually uh, surprised me. I started looking around me about five or seven years ago and noticing how much time people were spending taking care of their aging parents. And what I'm talking about is people in, in my generation. I'm an early baby boomer. And those who still have parents living have parents that are in their 80s and 90s, and they are starting to need a lot of care. So I watched a tremendous number of my peers spending huge amounts of time and money and resources and, and um, uh, just spending a tremendous amount of time being concerned about them. And I, all of a sudden I said to myself, my gosh, who's going to do that for us? Because I am a solo ager. I am married and my husband and I do not have children. So then I began to look into it and I went to the census and I went to some other studies to see if I could find out what the numbers were because from my vantage point it looked like there were an awful lot of us and in fact there are. There are 19.4 percent of baby boomers do not have children and I just sort of generally round that up to 20 percent but that's a staggering number. So if you That's look around huge. you, one in five baby boomers that you see on the street doesn't have children. That's huge. It is. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and I, I notice it just in my sphere of friends and family. You know, I have several, uh, you know, friends of ours that uh, couples without children. And, and then I look at, you know, I have children, but I, I look at their group of friends and there's so many that don't have children. So... You know, that 20 percent, approximately 20 percent number you mentioned, I, I would think just and I'm just going by my own sphere without doing any study at all. But are those numbers going to rise? No, <laughs> I don't no. think so. Uh, no. In fact, they may soften some. Ah. Those numbers have doubled since 1970, and it's easy to understand why. If you look back at the baby boomers history, two very significant things happened during the 70s and 80s when boomers were mostly in their childbearing years. Number one, we got the pill. So by the time boomers came of age, there was a fail-safe way of presenting pregnancy if you could give it even just a little bit of forethought. So we had choice. 
The second thing that happened was the equal rights activity, let's just call it, because the amendment was actually never passed. But um, there was a tremendous amount of noise made about how women were being paid so much less and didn't have opportunity to get the kinds of professional jobs that men got, and things began to change. So the generation of the boomers had an opportunity to really completely change the model of marriage and, and childbearing. And women all of a sudden had the opportunity to choose whether to have kids and to even choose whether to be married. They no longer needed a husband to support them. So women could be on their own or in a marriage and not have children. And it was very appealing to a lot of career women, including myself. Yeah, I mean, the opportunity for women or women, you know, uh, going into professional careers and uh uh, that has definitely increased, and I'm sure that that's had a bearing on, uh, you know, either those that are having children later or then to just decide not to have children at all. That's right. That's right. But I don't expect it to rise any further, frankly. Um, it's actually softened a little bit in recent years because um, the Gen Xers had more children than the baby boomers did percentage-wise, so it went down to about 18%. Um, of childless and uh, kind of remains to be seen what the millennial numbers will produce because we really don't have a good read on that yet. But I see a lot of baby strollers out. Yeah, there, there's, uh, but there's still staggering numbers, 18, 19, 20 percent. I mean, those are staggering numbers. Yes, they are. Yeah. They definitely are. And I look at it as, as what's missing is a kind of safety net because if you look at all the literature on how people age and what and who and and what they look to in later life when they really do need some care and help is it's always family. It's always been family. It probably will always be family. Although now, of course, you can see the um, the tremendous number of um, um, facilities that are being designed and built for people to age in the continuous care co- retirement communities, the assisted living communities. Um, they're all uh, trem- growing tremendously. So there are alternatives, but without family, really a lot of planning needs to be done ahead of time. Right. So I, I know that, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a, in, a, in a minute. I know you're writing a book on solo aging, which is very exciting. You're, uh, I know you consult with families um, on this subject matter and consult with actually uh, companies as well. Well, we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what are some of the key differences you've learned uh, with solo agers, as you call call them, versus uh, married couples or single adults with children, you know, more from a, you know, as it relates to planning and and, and advice that you've given them? Well, bottom line is that everybody should plan. Everybody should have a will. Everybody should have an advanced directives for health care. Everybody should have powers of attorney um, registered for um, both health care and finances because we just never know when something's going to take us out of the game. There are so many things that can render us unable either mentally or physically to care for ourselves or to make decisions for ourselves. And I think it's important for anyone over 50 to think about that. And you don't have to dwell on it for a long time. Just think about who you'd like to make those decisions for you, get it in writing, and then you can forget about it and live your life. But doing that planning is critical for everyone. It just gets amped up for solo agers because there's no safety net. We've all seen it. We've all seen people all of a sudden, older people all of a sudden decline. Um, they have a fall. They have some sort of an event. They have a stroke. They have a, um, a cardiac event. And who rushes in to make those decisions, go to the hospital, take care of them? It's always family. So when you don't have that, you need to kind of figure out who you want to do that for you. It may be a friend. Um, it may be legal counsel. It may be uh, we have a new 
kind of a new profession these days called um, fiduciaries, professional fiduciaries. Right. Uh, I recommend to solo agers that kind of look around them and go, you know, I don't know that there's anybody I'd really um, want to rely on out there. Okay. Um, find a professional fiduciary and connect with that person. You don't have to pay them anything up front, actually. But those people kick into action when something happens. So it, there's, a, there's a, a good thing about us all being kind of uh, connected and wired these days. Your, your records can be summoned from um, pretty much any um, medical facility you might be taken to. And in a few minutes, it can be um, determined who your, kind of what your backup plan is and who those people are that are going to support you. But you do have to set that up in advance. And I, I know talking about this sometimes can seem a little maudlin and depressing, but very honestly, I, I think that it bears some forethought, it bears some planning, and then you can really forget about it for at least five years at a stretch and then take a look at it and renew your plans, uh, make sure they're still fresh. Now, a lot of people, it, it's not an either-or thing. It's not either you have children or you're completely out of luck. I do know a number of people who are very close to their nieces and nephews and uh, to their siblings, some of whom whom, uh, have younger siblings. Uh, We never know who's going to outlive whom. So, of course, if you're married, your spouse is probably your your first line of defense. Uh, But beyond your spouse, and if you are not married, uh, think about who it is in your extended family that you would want to rely upon. Maybe you have a... a, um, a trusted niece or nephew that you would want to come in and uh, make decisions for you if you cannot. So there are family resources and you can name uh, a number of resources and they kind of are in a, in a chain, so to speak Um, with the uh, first one, maybe being a sibling and the second one in line, maybe being another sibling and the next one in line. um, If they both, um, are not able or willing to, to help out, then you go to the, the next generation. So I do encourage people to consider their other family members if they don't have children. Um, and then beyond family, to think about the people that they've been close to in their lives. And I think that people need to understand we're not talking about a niece or a nephew that would necessarily be their caregiver it's more, you know, helping them and, and guiding them and make, helping them make some decisions. I know that, uh, as you may know, I, you know, uh, my, my, my daytime job, my, my business, we work with families to, you know, help them find assisted living or memory care. And we're working more and more with the nieces and the nephews because uh, their uncle or, or aunt never been married. So that, mm-hmm. that's a good, a good suggestion. Um, uh, and- made a very good point, Frank. It's not that you're asking someone to personally take care of you. You just want to make sure that the decisions are being made for you the way you would make them yourself if you could. Right. I, I know that um, I you know, took a look at your website, which is great. Um, um, tell people uh, uh, you, how to get to your website again. Sure. Uh, my website is www.lifeencore.com. Okay, great. So it's a great website, and one of the things I uh, saw in there is, you know, an article about uh, financial planning versus retirement planning. So there's two different types of planning. You want to expound upon that a little bit? Well, I do retirement planning with people. I do it as a coach. I do it as a workshop leader, and I have people from all walks of life in my workshops. Sometimes they're Uh, I do them within a company that wants to um, help their retiring um, executives and managers to um, kind of have a a smooth transition. And I do what I call the non-financial side of retirement. Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? How are you going to spend these potentially 25, 30 bonus years that our generation now has? how are you going to add meaning and purpose to your life? So that's really where I kind of started off in this was um, coaching and doing workshops to help people figure out what's next. So what do you and, what do you tell uh, people that say, 
hey, I, I'm just I'm living home. I'm not going anywhere. I'm I'm going to be at home. How do you react to that? I react to that by saying that's absolutely fine. Um, some people I know a number of people that are uh, of the persuasion that they're going to have to drag me out of my home feet first. I don't argue with people about that. I don't push back. I simply suggest that they look around them and have a plan B in case they need it. Plenty of people live out their lives at home. I know quite a a large handful of 90-something-year-olds still living in their own two-story homes, still driving. People are living healthier and healthier lives into their 90s. So um, it's not impossible, and there are these wonderful um, villages that have, it's a village concept, it's actually a virtual village that have sprung up all over the country to help people live well into their later years in their own home, if that's their choice. But I also encourage people to consider other choices, because one of the most important things in staying healthy, both mentally and physically, is your social life. So losing connection to people is a very, very bad thing to happen when you're older. And making sure that you have some way of staying connected, staying active physically and mentally, and staying, uh, staying social. <laughs> and I don't mean social media. I mean really social. Um, meeting with people, doing things with people, going to stores, playing bridge, playing mahjong, whatever it is, just being with people is a very, very important thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's proven. So that's, uh, that's excellent. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, okay? Uh, sure. From a planning standpoint, so who are better planners in your experience, the solo agers or the traditional couples with children? I don't think it makes a lot of difference. <laughs> people, people have various um, attitudes toward planning that vary all over the map. In fact, I don't see it varying much by, um, by education level, by income level, by area of the country that you live in. Um, I do see it varying by gender. I think women by and large are more interested in looking ahead and and planning than men are. Although, um, men traditionally have been more active in doing their financial planning for the future, but women are probably more interested in doing the, um, uh, the non-financial side of planning for later life. And women are, are better at maintaining those critical social relationships and avoiding the isolation that, that is the, kind of the death knell for older people. So in speaking about women, you know, we all, uh, I think we all, I certainly do remember the, you know, Golden Girls at the TV <laughs> show. And I, I read some information about this, network that has formed the golden girl network and that kind of fits well into your uh, discussion and emphasis on solo aging can you tell us a little bit more about this golden yeah, girl network? There's, a, um, there's quite a few people active around the country and uh, encouraging people to move into multi um, um I'm, Households with multiple individuals, um, a lot of times singles will find that particularly appealing, especially, again, especially women. Um, women without partners who want to continue to have a, um, a live-in community that they don't have after their kids move out, if, if, they're, if they don't have a partner, are starting to live together. And there's one terrific woman in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, suburban Washington, Uh, named Bonnie Moore, who started up what she calls the Golden Girls Network. She's walking her talk. She has a Golden Girls home herself and uh, is now, has now formed a a network and is instructing other women and men in how to set up their own Golden Girls home. Now, Bonnie is an attorney by, um, by profession. And so she uh, is very savvy about how to set up set up legally binding agreements about what happens if um, uh, someone moves out or what happens if somebody can't come up with the rent or whatever it is. So she has both sides of that, and she's actively um, actively working that. In fact, Frank, you might want to contact her and do an interview with her because I'm sure she'd be delighted to do that. Yeah, that would be quite interesting. Yeah, that would. I, th- I thought it was uh, fascinating. I, you know, it's. It, you could imagine uh, 
you know, obviously it started uh, based on the name with with girls, with females doing this. Um, men would be interesting. That would be interesting. It would be like, uh, you know, one big uh, man cave or something. Yeah. yeah, I think so. She she has had some interest from men, though, so I think it would be interesting to talk to her. We were both um, speaking at the American Society for Aging this last year, and I got to meet her, and we chatted for a while, and I, I just thought she was terrific and told her I thought she was doing a great service, to uh, especially for baby boomers. Oh, that's great. So you, uh, I, I know you, you said you're writing a book uh, about solo aging, Um When's that coming out? Can you give us a little a little bit of information about it? Sure. It really kind of expands on the talks that I do on solo aging and how to plan as a solo ager. What are some of the things you need to do? And, of course, in an hour-long talk, I can only really touch the surface of those things. But in the book, I go very deeply in into um, what makes – for a successful, meaningful later life, um, how to plan to have a successful and meaningful later life, <clears throat> how, to, um, how to set up the kinds of backup documents you need to do that, how to plan for long-term care um, with the help of some of my um, partners in the Financial Planning Association and, and um, some elder care attorneys, uh, I was able to, to cobble together a great deal of really good information to help people figure out what they want to do and how to plan. And again, I, you know, I've certainly had people say, God, you know, this is kind of a, a dark topic. This is maudlin. This is, I don't like to think about this. I mean, great. Don't think about it. <clears throat> Beyond about a month worth of putting your, um, Getting your act together, putting the the pr- proper paperwork in motion, so that you're you're covered, and talking to the people you need to talk to about what you want to see in your later life. I actually encourage people, especially solo agers, uh, to form groups and talk about that sort of last taboo, which is what do I want in my last days. If you don't tell someone you're probably going to end up not where you want to be. Right. Where do you want to spend your final years? Where do you want to f- spend your final months? Most people still end up dying in hospitals. That's going to be especially true for solo agers if they don't put their wishes on paper. So I do a lot of encouraging about that, but I also do a lot of encouraging of people to get out there and have a meaningful post-60 life. None of us know how long it's going to last, but we can sure as heck take care of ourselves and enjoy what we have, which are, as uh, Ken Dykewald likes to call, the bonus years. And we've got them. Most of us now are going to live well into our 80s. Many of us are going to live into our 90s. And by the time, our, in 20 years from now, I suspect we will have, and actually statistics bear out, we'll have over a million centenarians in this country. Isn't that shocking? It's amazing, just amazing, and and you know it's uh it's, it's it is going to be a whole new world out there. You know, we talk about planning. You know, after sixty, I mean, we're talking after sixty, you could probably be going another thirty, forty years. You know, it's amazing. Exactly, exactly. And what are you going to do with those years? Right. There's right. a whole new life out there. There's a whole new world. Now, of course, a lot of this depends on how well you've planned financially. And one of the things I encourage people to do in the book and in my talks is to, if you have not yet, go to see a financial planner. Um, These are, uh, for the most part, people who work on a fee-only basis. Many of them will, will just charge you for an hour or two that you spend with them. Let them run the numbers for you. If you're retired, do you know how long your money is going to last? What you're going to have? And a lot of planners now run those numbers out to 103. Now, that's really, really conservative. Uh, Some planners are still using 90, 95. But, you know, I want to make sure that my money is going to last until I'm at least 95 because what happens if you live beyond that? 
Right. So right. make sure that you do at least see a financial planner one time, and then maybe again in five or ten years. And uh, I encourage people to actually um, let a financial planner kind of analyze what you're doing with your money. And find one that, that resonates with you. Ask your friends for, for uh, referrals. I wouldn't just go call the, the one that's closest to me. I would absolutely ask for referrals. I think you'll find, I think any, everyone finds that if they just start asking around, they'll find plenty of referrals. They'll find plenty of people that are using financial advisors and do feel strongly about um, how good theirs is. Maybe they've been with one for 20 or 30 years. Um, I know I have, and um, I would recommend mine to anybody. Okay. So, well, we're going to uh, have to have you back when the uh, when the book comes out. You'll let you'll let me know, and we'll have you back. We just we just have another minute, so um, why don't you quickly tell us some of the other services you provide, and uh, how would people get in contact with you? Sure. Well, again, I help people with the non financial side of retirement planning, and the retirement, of course, can look anything like starting a whole new business, buying a franchise. Um, to uh, being a a part-time caregiver for your grandkids. So helping people figure out what the next 20 or 30 years is going to look like for them, that's my business. I do it as a coach. I do it through workshops. Uh, I do it through um, my, my, the talks that I do and the writing that I do. So that's, um, that's what life on core is a business for helping people figure out what their next act is going to be. Well, that's great. And the uh, website, again, is www.lifeencore.com. And that's yes. L-I-F-E-E-N-C-O-R-E. That is correct. Great. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to having you back, I hope, uh, when, the, when your book comes out. I hope so, too, Frank. Thank you very much. Well, thank thank you, and uh, thanks to our listeners for joining us today. And again, uh, uh, go to iTunes. Uh, you could uh, listen to not only uh, or have your friends listen to this uh, show, but uh, all the other shows as well. Or you could go to our website at theagingboomers.com. We've got all of our uh, shows on there as well. And uh, you could also download an app uh, Call the Aging Boomers on your iPhone or Android phone and listen to all the shows. So, again, thanks for listening. Be safe out there, and we'll talk to you all soon.